Good morning. My name is Morris Fleischer, the pastor of Newport Mount Olivet United Methodist Church in beautiful Newport, Virginia, Giles County, in one of the most beautiful places on earth in this part of the Appalachian region. This morning, as we move into our Pentecost celebration, I have a few thoughts that I must share with you today. I was up most of the night last night thinking about what I might say this morning and how I might address what's going on in our nation. Because it would be remiss to just turn a blind eye to them and move on into our worship celebration. Sometimes the best made plans have to be laid aside because we have to deal with what is in front of us. My friends, I've been very disturbed by all that has transpired, and especially in the last couple of weeks. And this week, as we know, the incidents in Minneapolis that is the current buzz of discussion in the news cycle as a man was taken down in the street and his trachea crushed by a member of law enforcement. And this is not the first, first time that this has happened in recent weeks. We think about the events in Louisville and then the events also recently in Georgia as well. Some of you probably know my story that I went to seminary at Virginia Union University in Richmond, Virginia. Virginia Union is a historical black college that grew out of the Civil War as an institution to train black preachers for service in the world. In fact, the seminary was there before the undergraduate school. And black preachers at that time were not only there to give the word of God to the people, they were the first educators teaching people how to read and write and do math. And I wonder, as it's almost been 19 years since I graduated from seminary, what my colleagues might be telling their congregations this morning on this Pentecost Sunday. My African-American colleagues, what might they be telling their predominantly African-American congregations this morning? What word of hope, what word of comfort might they offer? I'm proud to have gone to Virginia Union because I got an education there that went far beyond the dollars that I paid per credit hour. I had professors who walked with Dr. King who were arrested in the civil rights movement who had to speak up to be treated as equals in the world. I'm thankful to have sat at the feet of Dr. John Kenney, Dr. James Harris, Dr. Miles Jones, Dr. Gloria Taylor, Dr. Ralph Rivas, Dr. Harry Simmons, and so many others who helped this Caucasian kid from Upper East Tennessee learn so much more about the way the world works, opening scripture and interpreting it in a different way from folks who have traditionally not gained from the equalities that, and privileges that we have had as Caucasians in our nation. What healing balm might they be applying to the soul of their congregations this morning? My friends, I've lost much sleep over this, and I wasn't even sure if I should even address it, but I would be both a coward and unprophetic if I had not dealt with it today. I would be betraying the trust of those professors from whom I've learned to speak out for those who need a voice in this world. I would be betraying my calling into ministry. I would be betraying even the person that God, I think, has called me to be. And this is not my bully pulpit. This, it is a great privilege to offer God's word week in and week out on Sunday morning and in the way that we live our lives together as a community. 
So this is not about my opinion. This is not about just my feelings. I'm hoping that we might get our minds around this thing today in the midst of this communion, confusion and chaos and consider what justice might look like. For every time we utter a racial epithet, we are making a mockery of that pledge that we learned back in elementary school that I remember leading so often in our Cub Scout, Weebelows, and then Boy Scout troop as the senior patrol leader, the Pledge of Allegiance. Is there really liberty and justice for all when someone can just be grabbed off the street and their trachea crushed to death under the weight of a knee? It is also a betrayal of our faith as Christians in Jesus Christ that whenever we utter a racial epithet or avoid someone that we think does not look safe or correct or appropriate or different, it's a betrayal of God's trust in us, a betrayal of following Jesus when we treat others as less than ourselves. And we must remember this. We must call out our better angels. For today we celebrate the gift of the Spirit, and it is that Spirit who gives us fruits that Paul talks about in his letter to the Galatians. These are what we need in this moment. The Spirit of love, joy, patience, self-control, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness. These are what is most needed in this moment. As we see pictures of burning buildings and we see protests on the street, let us not forget that it wasn't that long ago when somebody could be taken off the street and taken down to the tree on the main square and hung up by a rope. It wasn't that long ago that there were other fires burning, buildings being bombed by persons, cowards in white hoods, using their Christianity crosses as a guise, and then burning crosses on front yards, and initiating acts of terror and hate. It wasn't that long ago that these things happened and that oftentimes most went unnoticed, never had a day in court. People got off scot-free for murdering someone because of the color of their skin. It really was not that long ago. So let us temper our feelings, our emotions with the fruit of the Spirit this day. Let us take a deep breath, for that is the very name of the Spirit, breath, wind, and allow God to guide us through these days. Allow God to call us forth to our better angels. Allow God to give us a new vision for life, justice, and how we live with one another. And when we think about Jesus upon that cross, remembering that it was a kangaroo court that put an innocent man there on that cross to begin with, and that he was crucified by the agents of law and order unjustly there. And let us remember that crucifixion wasn't about bleeding out, but rather one died of asphyxiation. So perhaps as we think about the events of this week and we see that hideous video and the resulting chaos that ensued from it, we remember that Jesus died because he couldn't breathe either. Pentecost is our time to find and rediscover God's vision for our world. It is an opportunity for us to allow the Spirit to blow freely 
to open ourselves to the calling God has upon us. This is a chance. This brings us hope. This brings possibility. This can bring us into community as it did for those hundred so people in that upper room so long ago in Jerusalem. People from around the Mediterranean basin who probably don't look very much like middle-class white Americans. People who spoke different languages. People who came from different places. But yet somehow, through God's power and through God's blessing, became the fledgling church. And taking this message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of love and forgiveness and redemption and salvation to the world. That is my calling and that is your calling too as the people of Jesus Christ. So let us keep the cross ever before us. Let our prayers go out for our leaders, for our African-American friends and neighbors brothers and sisters, and may they go out to us and challenge us to confront the places within us where we find those one of those insidious isms, as I like to call them, prejudice, bias, whatever we like to call them, where are the places within us that need to be rooted out, and how might God help us to do that? May the fresh winds of Pentecost blow within our spirits this morning. As our call to worship today, I share with you the words of the 104th Psalm, verses 24 to 34. O Lord, how manifold are your works! In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Yonder is the sea, great and wide. Creeping things innumerable are there living things, both small and great. There go the ships and the leviathan that you formed to sport in it. These all look to you to give them their food in due season. When you give to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are filled with good things. When you hide your face, they are dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die and return to dust. When you send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the earth. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works, who looks on the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will praise, sing praise to my God while I have being. May my meditation be pleasing to him for I rejoice in the Lord. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, Creator, in the beginning you moved over the dark waters. From your breath all creation drew life. Without you, life turns to dust. Holy Spirit, Counselor, by your inspiration the prophets spoke and acted in faith. You clothed them in power to be bearers of your word. Holy Spirit power, you came as fire to the disciples. You gave them voice before the rulers of the world. Holy Spirit, sanctifier, you created us children of God. You make us the living temple of your presence. You intercede with, within us with sighs too deep for words. Holy Spirit, giver of life, you guide and make holy the church you create. You give gifts, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and fortitude, the spirit of knowledge and piety, the spirit of the fear of the Lord, that the whole creation may become what you want it to be. True and only light from whom comes every good gift. Send your spirit into our lives at the power of a mighty wind. Open the horizons of our minds by the flame of your wisdom. Loosen our tongues to show your praise. For only in your spirit can we voice your words of peace and acclaim Jesus as our Lord. Amen.
Now I'd like to invite Thomas Lawrence, who is the son of Tom and Elsie Lawrence. Tom, Thomas is studying for the priesthood in the Roman Catholic tradition. And so we honor his calling and his education and hard work that he has given in his seminary experience this morning to share our Passover gospel for today. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues, as of fire, appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak in other languages, as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one of them heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea, and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk. For, as you suppose, it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my Spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In 1983, Australia threatened to take the America's Cup from the United States. The U.S. had retained the coveted cup of yacht racing for many years. But that year, it, Australia mounted a very serious challenge. Australia and the U.S. were tied with one race to go. 
So the day came for the final race. Scores of people came to watch it. Television cameras from all over the world were there. The boats were ready. The crews were ready. The yachts pulled into place at the starting line. All was ready. But then there was no race. Why? Because there was no wind. And yachting no wind means no race. You see, it, it, it takes wind to fill the awaiting canvas of the sail in order to propel a boat forward. And it takes the wind of the Spirit to birth the church and cast it out into the world as a sailboat takes its course on the blue-green waters of the ocean. As the creation story in Genesis tells us, the Spirit hovered over the dark waters at the very beginning. The very power of God ready and able to bring forth order out of the primordial chaos. Nothing happens, we remember, without air. Air is essential to life. Lungs must have air to oxygenate our blood supply. Gills draw oxygen out of the water for fish to maintain their life. Plants and trees need air in order for the essential processes of photosynthesis to take place. Air is what enables us to hear the sounds around us, birds singing, the expressions of our pets, the voices of our loved ones. It is air that enables us to speak and to sing and to worship. Life is impossible without it. So it seems highly appropriate that the nascent church needed, as our text says, the rush of a violent wind. It needed that rush of a violent wind in order to come into being. Like a doctor clearing the airway of a newborn baby to make sure that she is breathing properly, the church too had to find its first breath. One thing that is important to remember is that in both the Hebrew and the Greek, ruach in the Hebrew and pneuma in the Greek, both of these words have multiple meanings implying air, breath, wind, and spirit. It is from the Greek that we derive our term pneumatic, like a tire that is filled with air. And the word pneumonia, a bacterial or viral infection of the lungs that often interferes with our ability to breathe. I love the way Luke paints his picture of that first Pentecost in the book of Acts. It is filled with noise and commotion and all the drama we could ever want. The symbol Luke uses isn't a cooing, gentle dove hovering on a gentle breeze but rather a violent wind sweeping through the room. And if the wind isn't dramatic enough, tongues of flame are alighting on the heads of those gathered there. Wind and fire are images that are biblically associated with the apocalyptic, earth-shattering events. This doesn't seem to be like that sweet, sweet spirit that is often portrayed in our gospel and praise songs. This is that dynamic, life-giving, unpredictable spirit of God who disrupts the status quo, who forces us to expand our boundaries, who sends us into places we never thought we could ever go, who gives us new understandings that we had never before considered. Pentecost was neither quiet nor peaceful, but let's face it, the process of birth is neither easy nor painless. Just ask any mother who has spent hour after hour in labor, or father who was in the room with them. I was with Marcy for both of her C-sections, and I distinctly remember the doctor who delivered our son Matt singing show tunes. And I won't forget Marcy there on the operating table saying something to the extent how can he sing at a time like this? While giving birth is beautiful in its own way, 
birth is almost always a messy and painful thing. At the first Pentecost, there was no angelic visitation in a white robe offering words of comfort, fear not, before giving special instructions to the recipient of the visit. This was the rush of a violent wind, something that we cannot directly see, but we can feel and observe its effects. The great preacher Fred Craddock reminds us of what Jesus told Nicodemus in the third chapter of John's Gospel. He writes, I cannot describe the Holy Spirit. I cannot explain the Spirit of God. Jesus said, It is like a mystery, like the wind. You don't see the wind, and yet you know when it comes and when it goes. Another clue to the dramatic entrance of the Spirit comes from the reason that those first apostles gathered in the upper room. And the reason why they were there, there were so many nationalities represented in the city of Jerusalem in the first place. Pilgrims had come from all over the Mediterranean basin to the city to worship at the temple and celebrate the Jewish holiday of Shavuot. Pentecost is the anglicized name Shavuot is celebrated on the 50th day after, Pentec after East Passover and is one of the three annual Jewish festivals, including Sukkot Paso and Passover. Both continue to be celebrated in our time. Whereas Passover celebrates freedom from bondage found in the Exodus event, Shavuot celebrates the freedom for devotion that was given through God's gift of the Torah, the giving of the law to Moses on Mount Sinai. In that story, we find God appearing on top of a mountain, shrouded in cloud and smoke. There was thunder and lightning, and the earth shook. So in Acts, the Spirit of God arrives in a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and fire appears not on the top of a holy mountain, but on top of each believer's head. Jesus' friends had spent those 50 days between Passover and Shavuot in shock and in mourning, still reeling from the trauma of his ex execution and inexplicable post-death sightings. They have gathered to comfort one another, to open the sacred texts in the attempts to explain their world. As they begin, the story moves off page. Flames dance, wind blows, and language transcends. What had been familiar and comforting is at once both mystical and terrifying. Yet it is precisely because the promised Holy Spirit is the presence of the crucified and resurrected Christ that we should never expect things to be easy. In the cross of Christ, we see God's strength mediated through suffering, God's victory achieved through defeat, and new life pledged and provided through death. The crucified and resurrected God we meet in Jesus is a God of paradox, and we should look for none, no less in the Holy Spirit. All of these gifts, the noise, the wind, the tongues of flame, attracted a, a bewildered crowd, amazed and astonished that simple, backwards, and uneducated Galileans are able to be understood in the languages that they had never spoken before. There's so much commotion going on that some wonder if they're not drunk. It takes Peter to stand up and remind them that something new was happening in that very moment, and that they were not intoxicated by distilled spirits, but rather by the Holy Spirit. He begins by quoting the Old Testament prophet Joel, who spoke about 800 years before, describing the, the events of the day of the Lord, a day when the Spirit of God would be poured out on all people, and would provoke visions and dreams and prophetic speech among the young and the old. An eerie and ominous day in which the sun would be darkened and the moon turned blood red. A day of judgment and fear and confusion. 
So let's face it, the Pentecost story isn't a quaint, feel-good kind of story, but rather a dangerous one. Nadia Boltz Weber, a Lutheran pastor and one of my favorite Christian bloggers, her blog she names um, the Sarcastic Lutheran. She shared about a set of altar paraments her church had received from another church. And she recalls, as a group of us went through these beautiful altar cloths, we finally came to the red set, the one for Pentecost, and found one with an image of a descending dove with completely crazy eyes and claws that look like talons. Yep. It was as though the Holy Spirit wasn't a dove, but rather a raptor. Man, someone says, we can't use this one. It makes the Holy Spirit look dangerous. Hmm, there is some food for thought. Eberhard Arnold strongly asserts that the birth of the first community of Jesus Christ in Jerusalem is too seldom taken seriously. Maybe, suggests Arnold, the miraculous account of the disciples speaking in tongues is too strange for most of us. And because we look at these events with great skepticism, it is often impossible to portray this most important experience except in domesticated, watered-down terms and concepts. It seems that all that crazy stuff that happened that Pentecost day in the first century Palestine bears little resemblance to the church that has become 21st century America. There were no pipe organs or praise bands or committees or vacation Bible school. At the so-called birth of the church, there were no ushers handing the Parthians a bulletin. The Medes didn't have a bake sale after the service it can be hard to see any resemblance at all from how we started to where and what we have become. But yet it seems to me that the more things change, the more things stay the same. Even though we think things are very different in our time from the first Pentecost, maybe there are many things that really are the same, and that certainly gives me great hope. Let's not forget that the story opens in the small upper room in Jerusalem. That small group of believers isolating themselves at the text says, all together in one place. Not unlike the risen Jesus miraculously appearing to the disciples through the locked doors, here we find the Spirit intruding into their lives. Here they were, gathered and separated from the public, Perhaps they were afraid of outsiders or those who might bring them harm. But had they actually known better, they would have been afraid of not dispersing. Because what was about to happen would have freaked out even the most brave among us. They were in danger, all right, but not from the outsiders. The danger they were in, as they all sat together in one place, was from a god who was able to about to crash the party and bring in everyone that they were trying to avoid. You see, we still have fear and isolation in the church. We like our cozy and comfortable place here amongst our friends, people we know. We are hesitant to allow others to come and share their gifts and graces among us. We wonder if they'll shake things up and bring about change and upset the apple cart. So it doesn't seem like anything has really changed since, has it? And what about those who did the whole speaking in tongues thing? Well, obviously they're the ones caught up in the spirit. And talk about multiculturalism at, at its best. Just read through the long list of different nationalities who were there, amazed and astonished at what was going on. It was truly a we-are-the-world moment. Then there were those who witnessed this powerful act of God, this pentachaos, and in an attempt to intellectualize it, questioning, well, what does this mean? And what about the moralists who said, oh, those people are drunk? And then finally, there's that nice but completely naive person who says, oh my gosh, there's no way they can be drunk. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. 
So you see nothing has really changed. People are people. There are the emotional ones, the judgmental ones, the naive ones, and of course the ones like me who insist on categorizing and naming everyone as though people can be reduced to a mere label. So there we all were, even from the beginning. Flawed, smug, confused, embarrassed, and embarrassing. In other words, the very people to whom God sends the Holy Spirit. Because you see, God hasn't changed either. Just like that first Pentecost, God still crashes our parties and invites in the people that we are trying to avoid. God still says yes to all our polite no thank yous. This is what is so dangerous about the whole thing. In which case, that red altar pyramid with the crazy taloned raptor dove is actually more apt of an image of the Holy Spirit than some soft focus Hallmark card dove gently flying in a watercolor sky. Obviously, when speaking of the Holy Spirit, we have to revert to all these metaphors of comforter and dove and wind. But the thing to remember is that the Holy Spirit isn't a metaphor. Metaphors can only point to change, but the Spirit is one who has the, trans the power to transform the world. Because the Spirit, while called the Comforter, doesn't bring the warm chocolate chip cookies and a night-night story kind of comfort. The Spirit brings the comfort of the truth. And if you've ever had any experience with the truth whatsoever, you can testify that it's not exactly cozy. To God be the greatest glory. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, and fill us with your love. Open our eyes to see the presence of God all around us, in creation, in the joys and celebrations of our lives and even in the tragedies and the struggles that break our hearts. Come, Holy Spirit, and comfort those who grieve. Grant them the peace that only you can bring. Stir within us a trust in life beyond death as we ponder the mysteries of Christ's resurrection and the hope we have in new and everlasting life. Come, Holy Spirit, and bring wholeness to the sick. Strengthen those who are weak. Heal the wounded and broken, give rest to the weary. Come, Holy Spirit, and inspire our worrying world to seek peace, to genuinely find compassion for our enemies, to have the courage to put down our weapons, to be cleansed from all the insidious isms that dehumanize and separate us from those whom you also created in your image. Come, Holy Spirit, and ignite the fire in our bones, a passion for justice that cannot be quenched until all of your children learn that they are loved, until no one is marginalized or oppressed, until everyone has the opportunity to thrive and live abundantly, until the world is transformed and renewed. Come, Holy Spirit, and revive your church. Liberate us from complacency and apathy. Inspire us with Christ's vision for a world reborn. Help us to recognize our gifts for ministry and to use them in the service of others. Transform our hearts and minds. Fill us with love that overflows. Remind us that there is no greater calling than to love you with all that we are and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Gracious God, give us a glimpse of your kingdom emerging around us and drawing us into the new things that you are doing. It is for your kingdom that we now pray filled with your spirit, using the words Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I send you forth with this closing thought from scholar and author N.T. Wright, and I think it's a very important one for us to consider on this Pentecost day. Those in whom the Spirit comes to live are God's new temple. They are individually and corporately places where heaven and earth meet. Think about that for a moment, that within you, as God's Spirit comes to rest in your heart, that you were both individually and as part of the greater community of believers, a place where heaven and earth meets. So go out into the world and labor to bring forth new life. Dream dreams, pursue visions, and speak of God's goodness in the words of those who would hear. And may the God who breathed life into creation be your delight. May Christ Jesus give hope to your dreaming, and may the Holy Spirit, your advocate and encourager, set your hearts ablaze with a passion for peace. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.